So welcome everyone. Good evening and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Meg Sheehan. I'm the coordinator of the North American Mega Dam Resistance Alliance. Our mission is to protect rivers and their communities by resisting mega dams and their transmission corridors. This is the second in our three part webinar series in which we feature activists and experts who are leading the efforts to expose the myth that mega dam hydropower is clean and green renewable energy. Next slide. Our third upcoming webinar will be on May 5th and that will feature experts on greenhouse gases and the climate impacts of mega dam hydropower and we'll be focusing on new developments in policy and law. Next slide. Tonight we are extremely honored to have community members from Canada who will be joining us to tell about tell their story about the impact that Canadian hydropower has had on them and their people. Next slide, please. I want to just show this map to indicate the vast areas that we're talking about, how far these mega dam facilities and transmission corridors are located from cities like Boston and New York, where we are using this power, importing it, and where we're planning to import more. So you can see that 63 dams are located throughout Eastern Canada. This just shows the locations of two of them. I put in the Upper Churchill Falls Dam here in Labrador on the Churchill River. One sixth of Hydro Quebec's electricity comes from that facility, and it's over 1,200 miles to Boston and a similar distance to New York. Over further west, we have the La Grand Dam complex, which is a massive, large facility on Hudson Bay, one of Hydro Quebec's largest dams, dikes, and diverts 27,000 square miles of boreal forest with a reservoir that is 1,200 miles. And so that area that is flooded for that one dam out of the 63 is the size of Maine. Next slide, please. The transmission corridors that are being considered to import this electricity and, and that under the claim that it's clean and green renewable energy include the new transmission corridor to get from some Hydro Quebec's facilities in Canada over on the left here from Appalachia's to the main border. That's a new corridor that is facing opposition in Canada. Then in Eastern, um, Mass Eastern New England, we have the New England Clean Energy Connect or the Central Maine Power Corridor. That is 145 miles that will be connecting up in Maine and going down to Portland and eventually on to Boston where Massachusetts has signed a contract for 1,200 megawatts of new so-called clean and green hydropower, although we are working very diligently to point out that there is no objective data to prove that this is clean and green and that it is actually a climate disaster. And over on the right here, we have the Champlain Hudson Power Express, also called CHIPI which is a 330 mile corridor that will be crossing the Canadian border just south of Montreal, going under Lake Champlain, and then under the Hudson River, that'll be completely buried most of the way, except when it gets down to Rockland County, it will become out of the water and onto land, and then it will go back underwater and over to Astoria, Queens. That is a project of Transmission Developers Inc. that is also proposing a similar quarter in Vermont. That's a project of Blackstone and we have uh, an active campaign in New York trying to stop the Chippy Quarter. Next slide. This slide will give you the idea of the scale of some of these projects. We're not talking about dams that you might see here in New England, where we're actually taking down very small dams and spending a lot of money to do so. These are vast complexes and very large dams. And as a result, the environmental impacts and the community impacts are vast as well. And this is just one 
um, example of how the manipulation of the river flows is constantly causing erosion and landslides because the reservoirs have to be filled, the water has to be filled into the reservoir, and then when the water is released suddenly, there are landslides and lots of erosion. Next slide, please. We'll be hearing um, tonight from Indigenous community members in Eastern Canada, as well as from the West Moberly Lake First Nation in British Columbia. This map shows the traditional Indigenous territories in Eastern Canada. Most of Hydro-Quebec's electricity that is exported to the United States comes from facilities located on Indigenous territories where they were built without consent. And you'll be hearing more about that. Next slide. We are here to support uh, allies in Canada who are struggling to seek reparation and compensation for the use of their lands for this hydropower. We'll be hearing from the Anishinaabek Atikamek Innu Coalition, who has launched a new website and a new campaign that is quebechydroclash.com. Next slide. In addition, the Innu Nation of Labrador has a $4 billion claim against Hydro-Quebec for the Upper Churchill Dam. As I mentioned earlier, that is one-sixth of Hydro-Quebec's supply that is exported to the United States, and that will be exported by these new corridors. So that makes us complicit in the cultural genocide and the environmental racism associated with these projects in Canada. Next slide. We'll be hearing from the West Mobley First Nation about the Site C Mega Dam, which is located in British Columbia on the Peace River. Very controversial, $16 billion dam. And there is a trial that's coming up, I believe underway in Canada right now over violations of treaty rights by BC Hydro. With that, I will, oh, one more slide, please. Okay. So the one more slide that I had was Hydro-Quebec's um, generating stations and the agreements that they have with hydro-impacted communities has been the subject of some research that was done by one of our allies at Waniskaton, which is an indigenous-led coalition at the University of Manitoba. And Kiara Nichols uh, has tried to document some of the agreements that Hydro-Quebec has made with some of the communities because it's often a topic of conversation and people have wanted to know about this. So we're happy to provide that to you. And with that, I will turn it over to our first speaker, Lucienne. Well, thank you uh, very much, everyone, and um, very happy to be with you tonight and hoping that uh, we'll be able to give you a, a good picture of what's happening here in our side of the border in the Quebec uh, province. And that's where we are, uh, we are uh, at this time, you know, and uh, all of those projects that's been happening for many, many years now, you know, um, it's been done without our uh, uh, consent uh, without our uh, you know authorization uh, without any other discussions with uh, the province of Quebec nor uh, Hydro Quebec but before I go with that um, yeah, I'd like to give you a little bit of uh, history here but I think it, it's going to help to understand you know what what is what is happening in Canada and, and Quebec also um, I'll, I'll start not too far in the beginning of uh, the 19th century uh, it's not that far in our memories uh, since we've been living in this uh, area in this continent for over 10,000 years. So uh, for us, it's 150 years, 200 years. It's not. It's not that far. So uh, you know, and when, when when we had contact uh, in this region, uh, because uh, the first contact was made in the beginning in 1900 here in this region. Uh, it's, and you know the Anishinaabe who uh, you know uh, I am Anishinaabe and uh, there's uh, uh, 11 communities and all 
uh, different sizes and uh, we live this kind of in this part of the, the country now uh, for um, thousands of years uh, it's called Canada today but we we, we named it uh, otherwise uh, way way back then and uh, you know when the first uh, settlers come, came around there was uh, there was this uh, wampum belt that we call it's a kind of an agreement between uh, two peoples or the belt represented uh, you know uh, the different uh, uh, agreements and uh, you know laws because we had laws also we had societies you know governing societies and we had our own people speaking the same language and culture uh, we had this way way back uh, before the first contact and uh, we governed ourselves in the way we uh, you know uh, uh, we did uh, in those days um, but and you know, um, in the 19, uh, 1898, I think, um, if my memory is correct, uh, you know, there's this um, uh, King uh, George III, the third, I think, uh, he, you know, he had this uh, uh, James uh, James Bay, um, North, uh, North Bay uh, Company, it was called at that time. And they, uh, the, the, the king gave authority within those lands for, uh, you know, uh, for, um, trapping uh, the beavers uh, and exchanges, uh, markets, uh, things uh, with First Nations. And of course, they, 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 they collected the, the pelts from those beavers at that time. And uh, during that time, well, there was uh, uh, agreements also with uh, First Nations that they, they, they dealt with uh, at that time. And, um, you know, um, there was a uh, King George uh, saying to a uh, provincial government at that time, it, it wasn't the same size those provinces at the time. It was different uh, in the, the shape of the, terri the territories that we have today. But the letter said that they, they needed to contact us, they needed to have agreement with us. And that was confirmed again in 1912 uh, by, uh, you know, exchange of letters by, by the crown of uh, uh, in, uh, in England, so uh, this uh, we, we have history of those. Uh, uh, we have those elements of the history, the exchange of, of the letters by uh, King King the King George at that time, and uh, of course the crown uh, that they represented. Uh, but you know those were the elements, the very important elements that they had to do before, even you know talking about the uh, natural resource development and taking over the lands that, uh, you know, that the First Nation had, like the Anishinaabeg, like the Atikamek and Inu Nation. Uh, that's a bit of history, but it's important to, to know and remember what, you know, uh, when they met at those years and those times, they had formal agreements. They had, you know, to do things amongst, uh, with First Nations and the Crown, you know, at that time, but, uh, Years have passed by, and many, many years later, uh, we're here and talking about those kind of, uh, uh, you know, issues that we have to deal today. And uh, the Crown did not respect any of its uh, engagement with First Nations people in in this in this country, Canada or even Quebec. So this is a bit of history. It gives you why we say unceded territory. You know, that's the understanding we need to have before we go and move ahead. Um, I wanted to give you this because I think it's important to understand and to know where we're heading with this file. Uh, you know, we've been trying for many years, now, decades even, to try to come up with something that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, good for the boat, you know, societies. It would be good for our people, you know, and uh, because at this time, uh, uh, we live, uh, you know, a cultural genocide. We live a systemic racism, economic racism. Uh, you call, you name it. Uh, it's happening now. It's always been happening for many, many years now. So we we're living in, in, in some of our communities are, you know, are, uh, are in dire poverty. Uh, they live beside a dam. You know, one of our communities here it's called Kitsakik. Uh, there are neighbors of our community here, not too far. And uh, they live beside a dam. They have no running water. They have no electricity. It's just beside the dam. So they don't have any, uh, you know, any, anything of those services that usually we consider today as a modern, you know, society in 2021. But they don't have that. 
and their children have to go away far to go to school. So they have disconnected the families uh, because of the, the, the law that uh, you know obligates the parents to, to send their children to school. Because if they don't, social service will come and take those children away. So that's the situation in one of our community. And there's another one that could say uh, the same thing. And um, it's very sad, even I would say frustrating. And when we see Hydro Quebec and the province of Quebec ignoring our people, ignoring our young fundamental human rights as a, as a people, you know, um, they're not uh, very open to, uh, you know, really have a serious, serious discussion and having us uh, sit together all around the one table and try to get uh, and find solutions, you know, that respects, uh, you know, uh, human rights, human, because I get, you know, I get emotional when I speak about this piece, simply because uh, it's so, uh, it, it's maddening. It's maddening, I would say, and uh, it's uh, it gets to me because uh, you know I've been working for many years now for my people, uh, uh, trying to get things done the right way and given their children, our children, you know, a future, a future where where they could be happy of their culture and still live in their culture, you know, not uh, given away uh, and still speaking the language. You know, I speak myself my language, Anishinaabe language. And uh, just to let you know, uh, I'm a residential school survivor also. Um, those years were uh, not good years for me. It brings me very bad memories. And there's a lot of our people that still have those. It's, it's not that far, like I said a while ago. You know, uh, it's only about 30 years ago. You still have that in your uh, memory. So uh, it's very hard to uh, wait up to have somebody in my home. <laughs> it's my grandchildren, they're coming in. So <laughs> sorry about that. Well, it's. Um, this 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 issue for us is is major um uh this is why we've uh, come together uh, you know with different nations uh trying to work uh, together uh, it's a first for most of us you know uh working all together and trying to bring this issue uh, at uh, you know uh, at different level at different levels uh, uh bring it bring the issue over across the border and uh, let the people know what's happening in Canada and Quebec more uh, with, uh, with our people, uh, with those dams. Uh, and like you said in your introduction, uh, uh, there's a lot of things happening that's not public, that's not being said by uh, Quebec uh, government nor by uh, Hydro-Quebec. Uh, there's a lot of things happening. There's people are drowning and sometimes in the spring times, uh, uh, a couple of years back, there was one man that drowned uh, in one of those rivers, uh, and uh, this is something that's really, it's really happening. So uh, I could tell you other stories, but you know, um, people, um, you know, they, they, they want to say their story, but at the same time, they, they say, who would believe us? Who would believe us? You know, that's the way they think now, because nobody's listening. For uh, the last 50 years, uh, no one government has, uh, you know, come to uh, to see us and try to help us out and, re you know, really help us because uh, we've given away so much. Uh, a lot of our lands are being drowned and uh, the use of the land are being diminished because of those uh, large uh, reservoirs. Uh, many of, the, of our people didn't... Uh, uh, they couldn't go very far because, you know, there's neighboring nations. Uh, there's also other families that use uh, the family, so they can't go uh, to uh, the other uh, uh, communities or, uh, you know, uh, other people's uh, land because they respect it. They respect uh, the other families and the nations, neighboring nations that, uh, you know, live beside us. So uh, they respect that. But at the same time, the, what do they have left? They don't, they, there's no compensation. Um, so there's a lot of things we could say about those uh, things. Uh, 
it's really saddening and uh, where you know we need we need help yeah we need help a lot of help and coming from everywhere this is why uh, we think that uh, we our story should be known by uh, the american people and we're asking uh, mr president biden uh, you know we've sent a letter uh, uh, you know asking him to be uh, supportive of our uh, you know uh, what we're doing here and we're hoping that he's going to be uh, hearing our you know you know for our you know asking for help um it's so it's been um a long uh, you know hard uh, work and uh, we're, we're not that much people try to to work it out because uh, the, the, we don't have all those capacity that government have so uh, we have limited uh, uh, capacity but uh, but with today's technology we're trying to use it uh, you know and trying to get uh, people uh, to know our story and hoping that uh, you guys will help too because it's important for us that uh, uh, more and more people know about what's happening in Canada because uh, internationally speaking you know Canada is uh, you know they, they seem like um, you know a good uh, society uh, quebec uh, does the same but you know we have this uh, constitution uh, and uh, it says they're supposed to be protecting our right but uh, they say so but you know when we go to court they they battle uh, with first nation and who try to rec make recognize their rights uh, we use the supreme court sometimes and uh, we win sometimes we lose but you know what uh, why does the Canadian Constitution says we have pr protected right, recognized right, but uh, it seems that uh, uh, with the provinces uh, in Canada, it's very, very difficult to apply. Uh, this is something that we've been uh, fighting for so many years. Our forefathers before us have been trying to do that. So uh, for my generation, probably I would be, I don't know, the seventh generation was, was still trying to recognize, to make recognize our rights, and uh, uh, it's a long, long uh, road ahead of us. And I'm hoping that uh, you know we will have allies. Uh, doesn't matter where they come from. To, to us, it's important that uh, you know that this uh, be known. What's happening in Quebec uh, be known. Um, you know, it's it's, it's very. Um, it's very uh, hard for you know to uh, try to make maybe people understand simply because it's a it's a very long story and there's a lot of things that i could say but uh, at the same time you know i'm trying to give you a, a good understanding and i'm hoping that I'm, I'm doing okay so please let me know if you if i'm doing okay so uh, i will stop here for now and if you have any question i'm open to, uh, to answer them thank you Thank you so much, Lucienne. And we will have questions at the end. That, that was really wonderful to hear. Um, and for our audience, I think it is important to realize that um, prior to hydro development, um, Indigenous people lived on ancestral lands in Canada, um, hunting, trapping, and surviving, and their social fabric and their community was built about, around hunting, trapping, fishing, and gathering. And once the lands were flooded and the dams were built, those lands were those ancestral lands that they had survived on for millennia and these remote areas were no longer available. Um, so our next speaker is Adam Jourdain. I'll check to see if he's on the call. Adam, have you been able to join us? Okay, I think maybe not. So um, we'll turn to Chief Roland Wilson, Chief of the West Moberly Lake First Nation, located in northeastern British Columbia. And Chief Wilson, if you would like to take over the floor, that would be great. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Tanzi, Johanaje. Uh, good to see everybody. I'm in northeastern BC. I literally just got off uh, uh, watching our Site C court case. <laughs> and uh, I was busy asking the lawyers questions and uh, trying to get it more information about what, what I just witnessed. And 
and totally forgot about this. <laughs> so I apologize for coming on late. Um, it, you know, it, it's, uh, it's disheartening to hear uh, from one coast to the other coast what's going on with our people. Um, uh, I miss the beginning of Lucian's uh, talk, uh, but for what I what I heard at, uh, when I came on, what what they're going through is exactly what we're going through. Um, I have a short little s presentation um, to to share if that's possible. I need somebody to share a screen with me. I believe you can do that on the bottom. Okay, I got it. Is it up? Can you see this? Yes. All right, it's just, it's a short little thing. Um, so I am Chief Wilson, uh, West Probably First Nations. Our uh, community is, is the closest community located to uh, BC Hydro, uh, Crown Corporation for uh, uh, power, electrical power in, in British Columbia. Uh, our community is the closest First Nations community to the WAC Bennett Dam, uh, the Wilson Reservoir, Dinosaur, uh, well, Peace Canyon Dam and Dinosaur Reservoir. Um, there are two existing hydroelectric projects on the Peace River. Uh, the first one was WAC Bennett, which was uh, finished construction in, I believe, 1969, uh, went to full pool at, at that time, and it actually produced the largest man-made reservoir, I believe, in Canada, and it's the third largest in North America, I believe. Um, it powers one of every three light bulbs in, in, in British Columbia, according to BC Hydro, and the smaller dam, Peace Canyon, was built in the 80s. Um, and it's, it's quite a bit smaller than the other one. And what's happening right now in our area is that there is a third dam, hydroelectric dam, large scale hydroelectric dam being proposed right now. Actually, it's under construction, it's not being proposed. And it's under construction in uh, um, about 65 kilometers downstream uh, from where Peace Canyon is located. And it's gonna, uh, if it goes to full pool, it will e it will eventually wipe up basically the last remaining functional part of the Peace River Valley that we have. Um, what I have up on screen right now is the oral promise that was made. Uh, West Moby is a signatory to Treaty Number no. Eight. It's it's the eighth treaty of the historic treaties that were made in Canada, um, and there were promises made under them. And I, I won't. I, everybody's probably read this. But I'll just draw you down to the bottom here where it says, we assured them that the treaty would not lead to any forced interference with their mode of life um, on it. Uh, this was the promise that was made to our people to coax us into signing the treaty, um, adhering to treaty number eight. Uh, and and this, this is, this actual paragraph, the, the beginning of it, this whole thing actually has been in a number of court cases. Uh, one of them was Mika Supri, uh, the, the argued uh, this part here in it. Um, what I'm showing you here is it's a, a caption out of the hunting and fishing uh, synopsis, synopsis that's put in place uh, by BC. Uh, every year uh, it's sent out. And this is the guidebook that shows uh, the residents of British Columbia and non-residents the rules and stuff of, of fishing. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, zoom in. So right here, this is the a mercury warning that is uh, identified for the uh, Wilson Reservoir um, that talks about uh, uh, normal consumption of fish may not be a significant hazard to human health, but high consumption may be. Uh, this is being put in the uh, 
uh, regulations guidebook in BC every year. And there has never been a study done on our nation about what the consumption of fish was or has been or is uh, to this date on this. So uh, high consumption is somewhat of a relative term. Like, uh, what does that mean <laughs> to a, a, a nation that lives off the land? Um, is that... Is high consumption considered to be like I would I would think our normal consumption would be high consumption to most people because it's as one of the staples that we have and what you have looking at here is kind of hard to see but this if you can see my cursor this is the Wilson Reservoir here this is the peace arm that comes down to here that's where WAC Bennett is and a little piece in here is uh, where dinosaurs. You can see right here it says Mobley Lake. Right here is where my nation is. Um, our sister community is the Halfway River First Nations. We were one community uh, at the time of signing of treaty called the. We were called the Hudson's Hope Beaver Band, the original Hudson's Hope Beaver Band, and and the both of us uh, adhered to treaty in 1914. So we've been. Un, uh, living with the treaty promises for over 100 years now. So as you can see, we are relatively close to uh, uh, the Wilson Reservoir and the Peace River. And the Peace River is, a, is a, a major corridor, river corridor through our area. Now this is the Wilson Reservoir. And what you see here is what has been mapped out is the Mercury Danger Zone. Everything that's highlighted in red on here is where uh, the tributaries that flow into the Wilson Reservoir, where they stop, there is some, some form of blockage where the, the fish can't get past. The, the water's either running too fast or there's a waterfall um, that's being identified. So you can see the original impact that was created by W.A.C. Bennett here created this Wilson Reservoir, but when you look at the cumulative impacts of what the Wilson and W.A.C. Bennett has created, it's much larger um, to it. And, and the level of mercury that's in the fish, they've argued for many years that the level of mercury should be subsiding in the fish. And we ran a study uh, a number of years ago in the Crooked River, which is located down here. This is the Crooked River. Um, down here, right here, is about where the uh, Arctic waters flow into the uh, Crooked River, and they flow into the Parsnip River. It come up, and they make the headwaters of the Peace River here, and the creation of the Peace starts right here. Um, uh, that and all that flows into the Arctic watershed. So the uh, Williston is actually located on the western side of the Rocky Mountains, and it's I think the only place along the whole Rocky Mountains that waters flow from the west through to the east on it. So it's rather substantial. It brings warm coastal air, western air, uh, to the valley here and in, into Hudson's Open along the Peace River. So it's kind of a, a, a climatic zone that happens here that we have prickly pear cactus that grow on the north bank of the, of the river, which is quite unique in our area. But you can see the, the level of impact that the Wilson Reservoir has created um, and what I have here is a short little video. It's a one minute video and what it does is it shows the uh, uh, development, industrial development. Uh, everything's starting from, um, I can't remember when it, uh, when it started, but it, it goes to, I think 2015. Uh, the Blueberry River First Nations has a very similar result. It's almost identical. I think it probably is identical to this because it's all based on the same uh, government information that we've been able to collect. And everything that you're going to see in this little video is is a uh, is government uh, that was pulled off of government uh, information. So it's just to give you kind of situated here. This is West Mobley located right here. This is the Soto River First uh, Soto First Nations located here and this is the halfway river so halfway 
River First Nations and West Wobie First Nations, we're one nation. Uh, we've always had a camp or a community set up on uh, Mobley, and halfway was always up there, but we would come together along the Peace River. And all along the Peace River corridor here were gathering spots. Uh, uh, you know, there was Gold Bar and, and uh, the Hudson's Hope, where Hudson's Hope came, there was a, a, a Hudson's Bay. Uh, store set up there because the First Nations would gather there and we would trade with the Hudson's Hope, uh, the Hudson's Bay Company. In Fort St. John, there was a national Hudson's Bay Fort set up at Fort St. John on it. So I'll, I'll play this video. Sorry, I'm rambling along. I've been <laughs> um, kind of out of uh, out of sorts here because of the court case I just I was listening to. These yellow patches here, those are mineral tenures. Uh, primarily, most of them around where we are here is coal mines. And all these little black dots that you're seeing showing up on here are oil and gas development. Um, oil, this, is, this is the breadbasket for BC. Um, most of all the oil and gas development uh, that the province generates, uh, revenues that they generate come out of, of the peace country. Uh, that purple blotch that you saw just show up there, um, that's the Wilson Reservoir on it. And you can't see it very well, but there's a legend down here and it explains all the different colors of what's happening. Part of our argument that we were having, our discussion that we were having with BC was, we were not opposed to the creation of the energy, what we're opposed to is the destruction of the valley. The Peace River Valley is the main corridor that flows through our territory. And we only have one of them. We don't have any other Peace River corridor and it's unique in itself. Uh, you know, there's uh, enough fertile farmland, alluvial soils they call it, in the valley to, to feed over a million people. And BC Hydro is, is planning on putting it underwater. You know, and, and just for that aspect, just for that aspect, the Peace River should be protected. But uh, lo and behold, there's a bunch of us, um, I guess, inconvenient Indians <laughs> st standing in the way of, of their uh, master plan uh, of powering up industry and, and residences down in Vancouver. Um, and heaven forbid that we should want to protect the Peace River Valley, what we have left of it, you know, and there's always been this argument, well, there's only a little bit left, you might as well just destroy the rest of it. And our argument is, no, that little piece is not less important, that little piece is more important because everything's focused there now because of what you're seeing on, on the map here. Um, you know, and the issue is, is, is there, BC and Canada were supposed to do what's called a sparrow analysis. Back in the 80s, there was a, a Musqueam court case called the Sparrow Decision that came out. And it was based on uh, a fishing right. And it was determined that government is allowed to infringe on a right if they can justify it. But they have to run a test in order to justify the infringement. And there was never a test done here. There was never a, a Sparrow test done on the Peace River. Um, BC just decided to, to build another dam. And it wasn't a dam, it's been proven that the dam's not necessary. It's not needed, the power's not needed. Um, and that's what we're in court with right now, I'm arguing about all these, uh, it, it, there's uh, engineering issues with the dam, it's unsafe. Uh, they can't uh, determine whether or not where they're building it is, is an actual safe place to build it because it's being built on shale instead of bedrock and shale it's kind of like i don't know if you've ever stood on gravel or rode your bike on gravel on 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 the pavement um it slips and you <laughs> if you're riding your bike uh, especially right now in springtime when there's still sand on the road it's very slippery so the the weight of the dam the weight of the reservoir sitting on shale makes it, it has a potential of it sliding and you can have a, a, that much weight sitting somewhere like that and have the the um, fear of it slipping because there's too much weight behind it 
And if it releases, everything downstream is going to get destroyed. Um, you know, so that's another big issue that's happening right now is the safety of this thing. But over in, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to restart that thing. This here is, is, uh, is uh, all those little dots that you see. Um, there has to be a buffer zone that's put around them because uh, of safety uh, issues with development. Uh, you can't hunt or shoot a, a firearm around that area. Um, there's H2S gas. Uh, there's all these different uh, concerns around all this development. So the government has put a, a safety zone around it. And it, that safety zone can go anywhere from 50 meters to a quarter of a mile. But uh, as a kind of a medium, they've taken a, a 500 meters uh, buffer zone. And that's a pretty standard buffer that BC uses uh, on everything. So when you take all those little dots and then you apply that buffer zone, you can quite see, uh, quickly see what's, what's going on in our territory with all the oil and gas, all the mining, um, all the forestry that, that's happening, you know, uh, and what, we're, what we've said is, you know, we're not opposed to the creation of the energy. Let's have a discussion about how to meet your energy needs through other means and save the valley because it's the last piece of value that we have. And BC Hydro just said, no, we're not doing that. And BC said, no, we're not, we don't really care about that. And, you know, we stood there with the treaty and said, hey, you know, here's the oral promise and no forced interference. And, you know, we're trying to be uh, reasonable and try and find alternatives to, to meet these demands uh, that you're saying that don't exist. They've proven that uh, all the, everything that they've said was all based on lies. There is no uh, no demand, uh, immediate demand for the uh, the energy, and and three times prior, well actually two times prior, uh, BC has a uh, an independent board that looks at these large capital projects that the uh, Crown corporations do, and they they ensure that the whatever they're proposing is in the best interest of the public. And in the 80s, they sent Site C to the, it's called the British Columbia Utilities Commission, and they sent it to the, the BCUC, and they turned it down. And when they turned it down, they said, there's, there's, the power's not needed, you haven't, you haven't uh, made your argument for the need for this thing. And, and if there is a need for power, there's better ways to achieve that power and you should look at geothermal. They actually stated in the report, BC has got high geothermal potentials. Uh, so uh, a number of years later, uh, about a decade later, Site C came back up and it went back to the BCUC. And lo and behold, the BCUC stated the same thing. You still haven't proved your argument for Site C. Uh, you know, uh, and even if there is a need for the power, you still, you need to go and look at geothermal and wind and, you know, all these other things. And they never did any of that. Uh, it, the third time it came up, and this is where we are now, uh, the government wrote the project out of the British Columbia Utilities Oversight uh, thing. They wrote them right out of it. And they made a political decision, not a, not a needs decision. They went around and told everybody, we need this power. They actually had a minister that was going around uh, throughout the province and, and stating that uh, if, if we don't build Site C, we're gonna to have to have rolling brownouts through the province, throughout the province, and we're gonna to have to determine when, when your town shuts off its power so that we can conserve energy. He went and said that to people. Um, and they've got it, I'm not making that up, they've got that recorded and, and documented that that kind of stuff was happening, which was all, uh, uh, lies. Uh, try and get out of this now. Yeah, I'm back. I'm hoping I'm back on the screen. Okay. Um, so where we're sitting at right now is, is uh, we're filing 
we filed a, 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 a lawsuit uh, well, claiming that uh, uh, they're infringing our treaty right, which by the, the map you can, it's very clear that they are. Uh, and I just sat through a, a whole day of listening to the BC Hydro's lawyer uh, arguing that um, they're not infringing our, <laughs> our treaty rights. And uh, they're, uh, um, now it was extremely frustrating to, to listen to on it. Uh, outside of that, I'm, I'm not sure what else um, I can say. I know that our treatment that we're having with the provincial government sounds exactly the same as how, how uh, the East Coast is being treated by Hydro-Quebec. Um, on it, uh, through this whole process, uh, we don't ha we don't have a treaty with with British Columbia. We have a treaty with Canada, and they were pretty much absent through this whole process. They 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 set up what was called a joint review panel. Uh, they had three people sitting on the panel, and uh, and it was a joint panel that represented the British Columbia Environmental Assessment Agency and the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency, which um, uh, because the Peace River uh, water falls under federal jurisdiction, they were brought into the, into the process. And throughout the, all the years that we were doing, um, our talks with BC Hydro and BC, Canada was absent from the table. And just before they were issuing their last permit, uh, Canada had to issue the water control license permit. Uh, was it water control? It was one of the permits uh, they had. It was, and it was a, it was the, it was a big one. And uh, we hadn't had one meeting with Canada to discuss any of this stuff, to, to consult on any of this stuff. And so we set up uh, uh, meetings in Ottawa, and. We had meetings with the Minister of Environment, the Minister of Indian Affairs. Uh, all we had all these things set up. We flew all the way to Ottawa and, and had to schedule a meeting set up. We, got, we landed in Ottawa. We we're just going to our first meeting, and uh, Prime, uh, Prime Minister Harper sent a note to all his ministers and said, "No one is allowed to meet with us." Um, he did not approve any of the meetings, and it was at that point in time that anybody that was having meetings uh, with Canada, it had to be approved by Harper. So we flew all the way over there, and, and uh, we're literally walking into the office when we got a, a phone call from uh, Minister Gluckhart. Uh, she was a Minister of Environment at that time, uh, saying, uh, we've been told not to meet with you. Sorry about that, but <laughs> we're in Ottawa. <laughs> walking around the streets in Ottawa trying to go, well, what the hell do we do now? And uh, um, yeah, that was that was a, the process of our consultation with, with uh, the Harper government. Uh, the, the election came up, the Liberal government came in, and we thought, okay, well, the uh, regional chief for, uh, for BC was just appointed as Minister of Justice for uh, for Canada under the Trudeau government and she actually came and paddled the river with us during the when she was uh, the uh, regional chief for the AFN she came up here and there's videos of her talking about you know what they're doing what they're doing to the First Nations is not right and it, it goes against free prior and informed consent and all this and when Trudeau appointed her as the uh, uh, Minister of Justice it was the first uh, Indigenous female indigenous person ever to be appointed to uh, that level of uh, ministry uh, uh, the ag's office is a, a pretty big office she disappeared <laughs> we, I, we went to ottawa and uh, i spoke with her for about five minutes and uh, never saw her again after that um, they took her right off of uh, right off of the file she wasn't allowed to talk to us anymore and that was the ex pretty much the extent of the meeting until this last permit came up 
and and uh, we get a phone call from uh, the minister's office from the federal minister. They were going to fly us to Ottawa to consult with them. They just called us up and said, "Hey, we you know we realize that no one's talking. Uh, we're going to we're offering to put you up in a hotel and fly you all the way back to Ottawa." And we said, well, we can't, we got meetings. We can't just drop everything. We, we, we're not just sitting here waiting for you to call us. You know, uh, we got we got a nation to run. So uh, we said, well, if you want to talk to us, you need to come here because we went there twice. You need to come here. And we get a, they hung up and uh, they phoned back and said, okay, well, we'll, we'll be there tomorrow. You guys need to come to Vancouver and we'll meet with you in Vancouver. And we'll be like, well, we've got meetings set up. We can't just drop things and, and run off because, you know, uh, Ottawa's called us to, to meet. There's, there's a process you have to. We finally arranged that to, we had to fly to Vancouver and meet with them. They brought their minister over and, and we had one one hour meeting with the minister. And then they uh, they flew all the way back to Ottawa, and they waited about, I think it was about a week and a half. And then they made their announcement, they issued the permit, and they consulted with the First Nations, got to check their little box. Um, never heard a thing we said. Well, they heard everything we said, they just didn't care, I guess. And uh, went back and, and checked their box. And it, 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 it's this what what is consultation that's that's a big question and we we ask that uh, uh, over and over and over our our definition of what consultation is 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 a dialogue that happens before a decision is made you know if if bc wanted needed the energy that site c could create being that site c is not the only option BC should have came to us and explained, you know, we're, we're going to, in 20 years, we're going to be in this energy crisis and we need to figure out a way to create that energy. Site C is an option. And then we would have came to the table and said, well, yeah, Site C is an option, but it's not a good one. There's better options that would be better suited to protect our treaty, protect the, the river and be uh, acceptable to move forward with, with BC on and, and we wanted to have that discussion with them, but the premier of British Columbia back then, Gordon Campbell, they made a decision that they were going to move, start moving forward on Site C, and then they came to talk to us. Well, that's not a consultation process. That's a mitigation process. They've already decided what they're going to do, and they're coming to talk to us to inform us and then see what mitigative measures could happen in place. That's not free and prior informed consent at all. That doesn't fall uh, undrip, you know, and all that was happening, um, you know. So that's that's kind of where we are. We're in court now with this. Um, still not opposed to the creation of the energy. Still willing to sit down and talk with BC and BC Hydro about meeting their energy demands without destroying the valley, and uh, uh, they refuse to have those discussions. So we've got no other means. Uh, of, of trying to deal with what's happening other than going to court and, and you know, spending lots of money. Uh, they have, uh, they have a, a, BC Hydro has the law firm Faskins working for them. They're one of the largest law firms in, in BC, uh, maybe in Canada, I don't know, but they're a, a huge law firm in BC. And, you know, we're, we're a small nation. We're fighting BC, BC Hydro, and Canada on this, trying to protect the, the last functional, remaining functional valley uh, of the, the Peace River. You know, so that, that's kind of where we're at with all this stuff. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Chief Wilson. And it's certainly a message for all of us here in the US where climate justice and environmental justice are on the forefront of our nation's energy discussions. And I think it's loud and clear to us that 
Canadian hydro built without consent is on Indigenous lands clearly violates environmental justice principles. And that's one of the things that we here at NAMR try to emphasize is that climate justice doesn't stop at the border and we shouldn't be importing this Canadian hydro and calling it clean and green and renewable. So we have a few moments. Um, we'll stay on until 8.30 for questions and answers and you can raise your hand or just feel free to jump right in. I do have a question that came in through the chat. You can put your questions there as well. And um, the question was for Lucien, and it was about what legal processes permitted the taking of your ancestral lands. So, 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 that he, uh, yeah. I, was, I think question, uh, thank you for that question. Um, and, uh, so I think this is a question about, you know, treaties and how they work and um, explaining it to us here in the U.S. for Lucien. Okay, yeah, well, again, thank you for the question. Um, you know, um, when First Nation had first contact with, uh, you know, the, the newcomers, uh, they, they, they were welcome here in, in this country um, by uh, many of our First Nations. East or West, uh, they, they were all welcome. And uh, there was um, alliances also uh, created uh, amongst the First People uh, in the, the white, uh, white settlers. There was respect at that time, uh, really good respect, I think. Uh, with the story we hear coming from our elders, uh, uh, there was respect amongst, uh, you know, those two uh, people living together in the same land. And the First uh, Nations, uh, you know, uh, decided to uh, share uh, pieces of uh, their territory with those uh, newcomers and help them out to survive in the harsh winters here. Um, you know, those were the first alliances between, uh, uh, you know, the settlers and uh, we, we have this, uh, like I mentioned a while ago, a wampum belt. It's a two line uh, wampum belt. It's like a, it's like a belt, like it's just two colors, you know, uh, side by side. And the one side is the, <clears throat> the white people, uh, the white settlers. And the other one is uh, our peoples, First Nations people. Uh, and in that agreement, it was said that uh, you respect me, I'll now respect you. You respect my governance, my people, my culture, you know, the language that was in there, the spirit that was given in that, you know, those first, uh, you know, agreement that would come between societies, between peoples. So to us, it was like an international agreement. It was not just uh, something between two people uh, meeting in the street or, uh, you know, at that time there was, uh, you know, the waters and the, the land, and that was it. There was no, uh, there was no road, so they, we had to show them how to survive in our side of, you know, the continent. Uh, because the, the white people, when they came in, they didn't know about uh, much about winter, you know. So we, we, we helped them to survive winters many, many years. And um, this is how it, it started. First contact, welcoming, you know, each other and trying to communicate it to each other. <clears throat> but you know what we must remember all is that uh, yes there was contact but also agreements you know to share and respect each other that was the first thing that was made so uh, uh, you know the treaties came afterwards uh, centuries afterwards it started around the 1700 uh, uh, with uh, the crown so uh, those were the British uh, people at that time and um, but the, there was also the French people in Quebec. Uh, but the French people, uh, the French nation, I would say, uh, they didn't have no treaties with any uh, of our nations in, in this province that's known today in Quebec, you know, that's within Canada. So uh, uh, only the, the British Crown decided to, to have treaties with First Nations in, in Canada today. Uh, but it was uh, done many, many years ago. So anyways, uh, those agreements are sacred by our people. 
if we have agreements with a nation, it's sacred. And we have those wampum, wampum belt to remind us what we have agreed to. So those are uh, some of the aspects of those, uh, you know, wampum belts, but it tells a story about a relation, a good relation at the, in the beginning. But with time, you know, um, uh, the white settlers on this side uh, decided that, well, Indians, Indians are not important anymore. We're going to take over. We're going to take over the lands without, you know, asking them. Just uh, sometimes by force. And you know, I was saying a while ago, I was, uh, I'm a, resident, a residential school survival. Well, that was uh, one of the aspects that uh, governments and uh, religion, and I would say, uh, not to name any, but you know, religion was used uh, to uh, segregate our people and try to, uh, you know, to kill the the Indian uh, in those uh, residential schools. I was about five years old when I went there, and I never came back until I was seven. So I lost a bit of my language. You know, I was mistreated at that time. We didn't have good food because uh, many of our young people I met uh, in, that, in those years, because I remember some of the faces, but I forgot the names, but I still remember some faces. And, you know, those, uh, some of them died in those residential schools. And again, trying to kill our culture, ignoring our rights, ignoring our people. Uh, Chief Wilson has mentioned that it's happening in the West. It's happening in the East. It's happening all over Canada. So, um, you know, Hydro-Quebec is a public service coming from uh, Quebec government. And uh, they don't want to uh, move ahead and try to have something that's going to be acceptable. We don't need that at this time. We don't, not, we're not asking for, a, a, you know, a land claim or a treaty. That's not what we're asking on this side uh, for the Quebec coalition with the, the Anishinaabe Gatikamekwe uh, But, you know, we want uh, our rights to be respected. And, uh, and just give you, you know, maybe Chief Wilson will give a, a bit more explanation about uh, treaties, but the way we see it, the way we understand it, this is how we still see today, you know, you respect me, I'll respect you. And, you know, we have our own society, we have our own laws, we have our own institution. Uh, you know, it's two governments, bodies, uh, two nations that needs to be respectful of each other, you know. So that that's the spirit that was uh, given given to the wampum belts in those, in those times. And you know what, we still remember and we still have those wampum belts today. We, we have them physically, we have them, we can read them. And uh, But unfortunately, when we speak to the crown, uh, the provincial crown or federal crown, well, that's that's whole story. That's history. We don't we don't deal with those issues. That's the way they talk, and that's the way we've been answered when we remind them that they have this agreement, you know. But uh, again, uh, uh, we've been ignored uh, for many decades now, and uh, it's ongoing, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. And we have another question for you along those lines. And that is, has Hydro-Quebec entered any impact benefit agreements with your community or members of the coalition? No, not at all. Not at this time. There was no signal yet given to our coalition. Uh, and uh, what we've decided uh, uh, lately was that we're going to be trying to send a letter to uh, Madame Brochy, who was the president of that uh, service public. And we'll be trying to, you know, to propose something, but uh, uh, no, we, we didn't have no calls coming from uh, Hydro Quebec or anybody from the government of Quebec at this time. Thank you. Okay, I have another question for you. Um, someone says, I'm an advisor to um, Ranapo Lenape Nation, descendants of original people of Manhattan still living in ancestral lands. Is there a message that you have for New York City and the financial sponsors of the corridor to New York? Yes, uh, I think it's important to, to give the, the, this message to the New Yorkers. We have been robbed of our future, of our land, the future of our children. Are, we, don't, we don't know what's gonna happen. 
we're just trying to, you know, to have people understand what's happening in Quebec and trying to understand the human aspect of it. So yes, we have been robbed and ignored by uh, governments of Quebec and Canada and of course, I have to come back here. Thank you. And we have another question, which was, um, how many dams are being built and where will the power go? So we did hear from Chief Wilson about the Site C Dam that's under construction. There is a dam being built in Manitoba, the Kiosk Dam. And um, do either of you want to speak about any other dams? in your territories? Well, I'll, I'll break the ice then. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, thank you for the question again. Um, we have uh, uh, a few dams with the Anishinaabeg territory. Um, I don't remember everything because there's, there's huge dams, there's small ones, and uh, there's uh, old ones that uh, uh, were not, uh, you know, uh, uh, known because uh, there, it was created uh, about probably 80 years ago, 60 years ago, and uh, Hydro Quebec has taken over. But uh, you know uh, what I can say is that you know 36% of the hydroelectricity comes from those dams, and 30% uh, uh, within our territories, unceded territory again. But I believe that uh, there's more than uh, 20 dams in, in the Quebec region, uh, including with the other na nations, uh, Tikamek, Inu, and uh, Anishinaabe uh, Nation. I think uh, there's more than 20 dams, small, big and small. So uh, it's a, uh, there's a lot of um, impact uh, in, in, within our communities, within our people because of those dams. Thank you. I, I I do know that BC Hydro uh, has um, a list of more dams on the Peace River. Uh, they've got a, it's called the Two Rivers Policy that they made way back when they were doing the uh, Columbia River Dam system and uh, when they were proposing W.A.C. Bennett, they identified that two rivers in British Columbia that they were going to use for hydropower were the Columbia River, which they basically have dammed the whole thing up and um, have created all kinds of issues down there. And the Peace River was the other, was the second river on there. And uh, so Site C represents the third dam, uh, but you know we've heard that there's three or four other projects. There was one that was talked about was the Dunleavy Dam uh, which was uh, Dunleavy is a little farther down the Peace River, just above uh, actual Peace River in Alberta. I think it's still in BC, but uh, well, it is in BC because it was a BC Hydro Dam. Uh, so they've got at least one more dam. Uh, I don't know if they're considering it. the The issue that's happening here in in BC when they proposed Site C uh, back in two thousand and ten the the proposed cost of the dam i think was around five five billion dollars which was pretty expensive back then and then it's just been escalating and escalating ever since uh, and what started at a, a five or six billion dollar dam is is now uh 16 billion dollars uh, because of the the safety issues that are happening with with site c in our area um, the, the inflated cost uh, is is primarily to deal with with that dealing with the shale and the, un, the instability of, of the the area that they're trying to build the dam on is susceptible to earthquakes they're doing shale gas uh, development here which causes earthquakes <laughs> in itself and they've already had one uh, uh, it was a 4.3 or something like that that was caused by a oil and gas company fracking the ground close to site c and uh, uh, destabilized um, the diversion tunnels and they had to evacuate site and everything on it so uh, it, when they started with this uh, it was it was talked about that site c is going to produce uh, 800 megawatts of power uh, for 400,000 homes in british columbia 
And right after they announced Site C, they announced the power line going up into the Horn River. And, and the Horn River, there's not 400 people going to move up to the Horn River. <laughs> Horn River is a shale gas development play uh, north of Fort Nelson. And uh, that power line was to go there. Um, but uh, the shale gas was supposed to be the LNG market here in, in British Columbia. And LNG fell through. Uh, and they haven't, they haven't built one LNG terminal yet here in BC. Uh, so Christy Clark, when she came in, she was the, the runner up after uh, Gordon Campbell left the Liberals. Christy Clark came in as the premier for British Columbia for the Liberal Party. And she was over in Alberta trying to sell the power to Alberta. And Alberta said, well, we don't want it. We've got coal fired plants here and natural gas fired plants here. We, we don't know what to do with our power. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure if you're aware, but when they're running coal fired and natural gas, they can't shut them off. They have to run all the time. So at night when they don't have, um, when everybody goes to bed and turns off their lights at, at night, they still have all this power and they have to get rid of. So BC buys that power from, from Alberta really cheap. And they uh, shut the dams down. They turn off their turbines and back up the water. That's, that's the, the benefit of having a dam is that you can turn the turbines off and store the water. It's like a big battery. They just create more energy by storing the water. And then when there's a high demand during peak hours, they stop buying get, uh, the power from Alberta and then release the turbines and, and generate power here and then sell that power to primarily California. You know, but then California has made a statement saying that they're not buying any more power from dirty dams. You know, they don't recognize dams as being clean or green on it. And uh, that was uh, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger had said that um, at one point in time. And they were down in, uh, Christy Clark was down in California trying to sell the power to California. <laughs> and they still don't they don't need the, the power demand here isn't going to happen until 2035 you know and, and uh, so they're going to have this glut of energy on the market for all this all this time and they're not going to be able to sell it to cover the cost of what site c is now 18 uh 16 billion dollars that's that's not uh that's not a fixed thing they just, he put that out there, it's going to be six, 16 billion now. Um, they still don't have the answers for the instability of trying to, trying to build this thing on the shelf. And, and it's a big question mark. It could quite easily exceed $20 billion here. And, you know, we're already, that's the most expensive uh, uh, infrastructure project in, in Canada right now on it. And, uh, yeah, it's crazy. Thank you for that. And we do have more questions about new dams. So yes, Hydro-Quebec is um, completing the Romaine River dams, four dams there. There is a new dam that's proposed on the Churchill River, the Mistachipo River in uh, Labrador. That's the Gull Island Dam. We do have a petition to sign for that to try to stop that. That would be the third dam on the Churchill River, um, much like the Peace River, this will be the last remaining flowing water that would be blocked. And it's, so it's really important to save that last remaining segment of the Churchill River. And um, the Government of Canada through different hydropower associations and whatnot did testify this summer that um, Canada has a lot of resources, hydropower resources to share with its neighbors to the south and stated that they've only developed 40% of their potential resources and they'll be looking to develop 60, the remaining 60% of the free flowing rivers in Canada to provide hydropower in the future for um, their neighbors to the south. So it's really important for all of us to um, make sure that climate bills and green energy bills and Green New Deals do not include Canadian hydropower because you can see the environmental racism, the methylmercury poisoning that it causes, and the damage, of course, the ecology and our free-flowing rivers and biodiversity in Canada. So um, we have another question. What are some concrete ways that New Englanders can help the fight against further development of dams 
by Hydro-Quebec and the uh, Champlain-Hudson Express Corridor. Uh, get involved by citing our petitions, joining our coalition, contacting regulators, especially in New England, that this is not clean and green renewable energy, that there's no proof of the um, greenhouse gas impacts. Hydro-Quebec cannot substantiate its claims that this is carbon-free or low-carbon energy. And if you're in New York, join up with our campaign there to let Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio know that they should not be signing a contract um, with Hydro-Quebec to import that electricity to New York City. And we can put you in touch with, um, directly in touch with some of our allies there if you're in New York. I would recommend you do the same for California too, on the east and the west coast. <laughs> okay, sounds good. I thought California, like you said, um, was not recognizing imported Canadian hydro as clean and green, but we need to be aware of that. I, I agree. I think they're still purchasing power from the Columbia River system Okay. on that. And I do want to take a moment to acknowledge um, some of the guests, and I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but I see that we have the Honorable Mary Jane McCallum on the call, and I would just want to invite her if she'd like to, to say a few words. Good evening, everyone. How are you? How are you, Chief Wilson? Well, <laughs> that okay. Um, I I'm just, healthy. Um, that's I'm healthy. Good. I haven't stopped thinking about the hydro dam since I went to visit Site C Dam, and um, we've gone to visit the Kiask Dam in Manitoba quite a few times. So I'm still busy with um, in Senate with looking at the adverse impacts, but it's it gets a bit difficult because. Um, some uh, Senate is um, pro more pro industry. Uh, it's getting less so. So I have a motion on the table to study the adverse impacts of resource extraction. But one of the things that we've met with the Auditor General of Canada and continuing our conversation for her to put in uh, an investigation, an intersectional investigation, not siloed on the impacts of resource extraction with all, all the different types of extractive companies. And um, they're more agreeable to it now. So I think if all the three people, uh, the three, the two presenters and the one that wasn't here, if they sent a letter to the Auditor General's office and CC'd us, because we're gonna be meeting with them soon and uh, just bring it to her attention and CC or provincial um, auditor auditor general within the province because um, resource extraction is I mean uh, natural resources is a provincial territory so we've met with uh, the Manitoba auditor general and they they were agreeable to work with the federal department so we've been busy on that front um, we're going to meet with them again soon. So if you could have it, and if you could CC the energy committee with uh, about the hydro, the mega hydro projects, that would be good because, um, you know, that would be a potential to investigate that, uh, that area alone, the hydro. Okay, but it's nice to see you all and I haven't forgotten uh, my visits, you're still in my hearts and um, keep up the fight. It's really, people do such amazing things when they have that fight in them and it's, you know, it's done with such spirit and such soul and, and we need to hear that in Senate, you know, it needs to come to the floor and um, we might be able to do a motion on it, on the hydro. So uh, if you could send in those letters and CC us, that would be uh, good, for, good for the country to see where we're at. And if you can um, CC 
um, the Justice Minister, Lametti, and Caroline Bennett, because they just went across the, they did a virtual um, um, consultation across Canada about uh, Bill C-15, which is uh, the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I was just looking at that um, because in there they said they wanted to better sustainable development, addressing climate change, fighting discrimination, including systemic discrimination and racism, uh, self-determination, self-government. So that's a good... Um, it's a good time to be bringing this in now. And I think one of the questions I had put in the chat was about uh, UNDRIP because BC is the only province that has adopted it. Do you know if they're working with UNDRIP in BC with your court case? We're, pu we're pushing it. Um, Site C does not fall under uh, UNDRIP. It doesn't meet the meet UNDRIP and it's one of the arguments we have in our court case, yes. Okay. Thank you, Senator McCallum. And I, I was so honored to hear you speak at the Wanis Katan um, oh. conference. And um, if you would like to share a little bit about your background and coming from Barron's Land First Nation in Manitoba and some of the hydro development there. Uh, yeah, I'm from uh, Barren Lands uh, First Nation, which is Cree um, Isolated Reserve in northern Manitoba. And I was also a resident of uh, residential school for 11 years and um, went to uh, school in Nepal and then went back. I went back to work. I'm a dentist. I just retired April 1st after 48 years in the dental field. I did part time um, when I'm in Senate. Um, but I started to get involved with the communities because I had worked in South Indian Lake as a dentist um, and I saw the impacts of of hydro there and then when I got into Senate I knew I was going to go into energy committee because of natural resources because that's a that is um, our it's in our treaties, you know, it's got, it's environment, energy, and natural resources. And that's where I started to learn about uh, all the cumulative impacts of resource extraction, oil and oil, gas, hydro, lumber, mining, fracking, and, um, and got very concerned about it. So we've been involved with, um, with all of those, <clears throat> we, <clears throat> We haven't quit since I went to uh, visit Site C Dam. We've been busy trying to bring it to committee and Senate. And um, so um, that's my history and um, very honored to work with First Nations people. Thank you Thank so you. much. Well, we're so honored to have you. Thank you for all your great work. Thank you everyone for your great work. And we probably have time for one more question. Um, I'll see, can we get the map that Chief Wilson showed with all the extractive industry sites? Would you be willing to share that with us? Uh, yes, did you record this session? Yes. Yeah, so you have it. So if you want to pass it on, you, you can. All right, so and I guess we can put up our, our last slide at this point. Um, we did record this. It will be um, saved on our Facebook page and we'll also be posting the Zoom recording on our YouTube channel. And so we obviously want to thank everyone very much for joining us. I think the prior slide, Julian has um, some take action things, just a few things. Um, if you'd like to stand with the West Moberly First Lake First Nation, you can go to the Raven Trust website and find out some information. We have a petition demanding that regional leaders in the U.S. reject Canadian hydropower. We have a sign-on letter that we're working with Canadian allies to circulate both in the U.S. and in Canada, opposing the Gull Island Dam on the Grand River, the Churchill River, and in, in Labrador. 
and you can find out more about Lucien's um, community at the website there and um, be in touch with him if you'd like. And so thank you everyone again for joining us. A few more take actions in Washington, D.C. here as far as the uh, uh, Central Maine Power Corridor Permit and energy policy. I'm just glad to hear that Lucien's coalition is contacting the president and there's other things we can do to stop the corridor that way as well. You can get in touch. We have some references and resource materials on our website. And thank you again, everyone. And it's been a great webinar and we're just so honored to have both Chief Wilson and Lucien joining us. And of course, Senator McCallum and all of you as guests as well. Thank you.